And I'm going to talk to you about some, what well, we call the design animation or design visualization workflows inside of 3ds Max. And 3ds Max is an important, you know, kind of cornerstone or keystone in, in the design visualization process because it's part, it's part of every design suite that's, that's out there. So just a question for you, who is currently already working with 3ds Max? One, two, three, four. Few, not, so not everyone, uh, but a little, bit. a little bit. Okay, there we go. Okay, good, good. Um, I usually start with that slide, uh, and this is a Game of Thrones wallpaper, really. And I don't know who is familiar with that TV series. Some, some maybe Game of Thrones. No, yes, no, no. <laughs> Please not. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fantasy series, and it's it's um, you know the, the a mixture of fantasy, dragons, medieval, lots of visual effects in there. And why I have is um, the the reason I have this in here is that is basically it's being produced inside of Three Max. So we have three studios in Europe who are producing Game of Thrones, all the whole the, the matte effects, uh, matte paintings, and special effects. The, the dragons are being animated in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, all the winter stuff is being done in Ireland. And uh, so, so that's, that's pretty cool. And as I said, that's all inside of 3ds Max. And that's also the reason why we put 3ds Max and 3ds Max design back together into one version. So there was always like these two footprints of 3ds Max and 3ds Max design, making it more or less complicated to talk about 3ds Max, which version of 3ds Max, on the internet, find tutorials, etc. So it's back to one package. You have the full-blown you know, feature set in 3ds Max 2016. And there's no 3ds Max design uh, in, in that case anymore. Uh, perfect, so, so that's cool. I'm going to focus on two different scenes that have been provided by, da by Data Tracing. Data Tracing is an Italian visualization company. Uh, they've given us the exterior that we see here as well as an ex interior scene which is basically a kitchen scene. And before we come into that, uh, just a brief look at that kitchen mixer. This one has been well, remodeled inside of Inventor and in 3ds Max 2016, talking about bringing stuff in, like importing stuff. That's, that's, that has become a whole lot easier because we now support the Autos Translation Framework, ATF. Right? So we have native support of CATIA files, SOLIDWORKS files, you can import Revit data uh, natively, and, uh, as well as Inventor files and a whole lot more. If you first start up 3ds Max for the kind of the first time, uh, you are a post. Um, you find yourself with a with a welcome screen, right? So here we have startup templates, which you can define on your own. So there are a few startup templates shipping at 3ds Max, but the real benefit is that you can set up your own rendering system and your own environment for. For example, product shots, right? So you can have a turntable system where you can just drag and drop, import your uh, kitchen mixer or your car into your scene and everything is kind of set up so you just need to hit render. And that's, that's what the template manager does for you. It has small little export import buttons down here so you can share these templates with your colleagues as well. And if you're the first time inside of 3ds Max, use the welcome screen to also access the tutorials, so there are a number of you know one minute startup videos just to, to let you know how to place a camera, how to set a light, how to navigate in the scene. All of that is being covered in like roughly 10 minutes of, of video. So it's really very uh, focused on, on getting you started as quick as possible. Cool. So let me show you one more thing. So based on these templates, we also have different workspaces. And this is something that we introduced in 3ds Max 2016. Well, not, not, that's not entirely true. Workspaces have been there before. But what is new is the access to a design standard workspace. And this gives you a whole new ribbon. So kind of the, the ribbons that are you're fam all familiar with inside of Revit or, or Inventor. But in that case, this one is talking about 
getting yourself started by importing or merging in uh, 3D data. It's going over to object inspection, so you can see, you know, if the measurement is right, if your units are all set up, basic modeling setups, uh, materials. Materials include setting your UV coordinates. All of that is basically gathered right at your fingertips within that ribbon. The idea is not having to search through the whole user interface to get access to stuff that you will use over and over again anyways. So this is kind of guiding you through the process that uh, you know, all those things might be fitting for, I don't know, 70-80% maybe of the standard visualization uh, kind of type of guys, right? Getting you started again, I have my XREF objects opened up. Uh, so external references is a very good way of collaborating with different 3ds Max scenes on different machines. So think of a building where uh, artist A could work on one story of the building and the next one could work on the second one and the third one. So you can split these objects apart and make them alive or living inside of separate 3ds Max objects. So we've done exactly that for that kitchen, mi kitchen mixer. If I can find it, there we go. So now I have linked up that Max file. And that Max file is still accessible by any other guy on my team or maybe a, um, a third party vendor, I don't know, some, some, something like that, right? Uh, but it's also living in my scene. And if, if he's doing updates to that object, it's going to be reflected back into my scene. That's kind of the idea of external references. There are some advantages that you can you know, use on top of that. So for example, if we pick the material, you will see that we now have access to an override material. So this is storing the original material that is kind of linked in the, in the max file. But if you wanted to change that, you can um, activate the, that overriding and for example change the color of that mixer but just by adding a new color right and if you want to go back we just enable or disable the the override that's kind of the the idea behind that and it does a whole lot more than that you can also import or link up animation controls with the new external reference system that is well basically has been re, re Re renovated, renovated, right? Um, or renewed or re established, I don't know. Um, into 3s Max uh, 2016. Cool. Another, another uh, very clever thing if you have some, some assets in your scene already, like I have up here, so you have th these are just different viewports. I've been importing some of these assets in preparation of this presentation. So in order to quickly populate your scene with these kind of assets, what you can do, you can select and place with that tool. It's called select and place. It's up there with the move rotation scaling and then it's select and place. And that's a tool that has been introduced in cooperation with IKEA. So IKEA is using 3ds Max heavily to, to render all their products imagery in the product catalog that's all like 100 percent max all the stuff that's online on their home page it's all max and then the interior shots the living rooms the kitchen scenes um you know all, all of that 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 stuff that's up to 30 percent rendered only 70 percent is photographed or sometimes it's a mixture of both right and what the select and place does for you you can just well select something and place it into your scene so in that case i'm going to select an object in one of my viewports and drag and drop it over into my scene and it's it's basically like a like a surface snap okay so you can quickly you know place something in that shelf right there or uh, do a book up here maybe another book you know copy stuff on top of each other that's something that's working out quite nicely if you happen to have something that has its pivot point not at the base of the object it will do something like this Okay, hmm. so that doesn't look good. 
a uh, very easy way to, to work around that is doing a right click at that select in place. And here we have the option to use the actual bounding box of that object as the pivot point. Right? So you don't have to replace the pivot point and reset it back to the base. You can just use the, yeah, the, the bounding, bounding box, so to speak, on the table. They're actually also using on top of that uh, physics engines to scatter up objects. So if you have uh, plates, or glasses that you want to stack up, they always use a little bit of bullet physics and wiggle around to to make that you know make it less static or or make make it look more natural, right? So I have a second uh, state set. Here we have the placement kind of completed. Um, that's that's pretty cool. So another big addition for 3ds Max 2016 is a framework change that we introduced and that's called the Max Creation Graph. It's, it's a visual representation of you know, giving you the opportunity of programming or creating your own procedural modifiers or objects. And that's scary as it sounds. That's nothing everyone needs to use, right? I don't, don't expect anyone in here to actually open up Max Creation Graph and start programming. Even though it's a visual representation of code, it is still very technical. But this allows other users, technical directors who love that kind of thinking, you know, schematic code, oh, that's awesome, da da da. Uh, they create hundreds and potentially thousands of different modifiers that are available for free to download. To, to everyone. So we have our own MCG, Max Creation Graph, Facebook website, we have ScriptSpot and the area. Those are three websites where you can download, already download hundreds of different compounds and operators. Uh, other than just giving you like one or two new modifiers a year, like with a major release of Max, now you have that framework that enables you to, to get access to a whole bunch of different uh, tools. I have two or three tools that I just want to show you, just to give you an, kind of an idea of what it can do. For example, if we talk about object placement, we could use an array to quickly line up uh, street lamps, for example, on a, on, on a road. We could do that procedurally in the way that we are at any Point, we can come back in and change the gap, the distance between each of these lampposts or the distance between each of a kitchen knife. Just, you know, it could be everything. So in that case, for, for, for that matter, I'm going to use the modifier stack. I'm going to add a clone uh, modifier that has been created inside of the Max Creation Graph. So now I can procedurally, instead of doing it in the array tool once and then it's fixed, um, I can come in here and I can say, okay, I want to have one or two, two or three clones of that. I might also want to change the scaling a little bit, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the way one of these MCG tools could work for you. Okay, uh, we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have other MCG tools that allow you to use a spline, a 2D spline to define where that cloning should take place. And uh, we also <laughs> generated another object down here. There we go. So this was one that we generated like half a year ago, so kind of when we released 2016. And this is a window blind object. As you can see, it's not only like an object, but it has all these parameters right there. Uh, this is like the, the width, uh, the thickness, the padding between the lines, all of that can be adjusted. And because I have all these parameters available, I can hook that up to other objects in my scene. So what I did is, I used a 3D object, which is that ah, that kind of little, I don't know, knob button thing <laughs> down there. And I can pull that up and it will actually change the parameter of my window blinds, which is a procedural object. And I have that cylinder right there. And if I rotate that, it will close and open these window blinds. Yeah. <laughs> right? So just, just think of that. These are just examples, right? You could actually wire that to your sun system. So if your sun travels by and it hits 
the windows, it will automatically lower the window blinds for you. You don't have to do that. And think of bigger scale. Think of windows uh, in a hospital or a convention center where you have hundreds of windows, right? So you can automate all of that stuff for, for you automatically, right? Uh, one last thing, here I have um, a door, and that door has been generated in MCG again, so, so uh, once again we can, uh, la, 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 we can adjust the, the overall look of that, of that door. But not only that, we could move that around, so uh, we could move it over there, and as soon as I let go, the wall will replace or kind of refit itself so the the hole is fitting to the to the wall right to the to the door to the door and I also hooked up that kind of small I'm, I'm, I'm lacking the word right uh, but but that thing yeah so it's it's all of that it's the, the key word really is proceduralism so if you want to make changes if your customer wants to make changes you don't have go to go like, oh my god, I can't change anything. No, it's quite easy. If you want to build it up in that way, like more procedurally, absolutely, you can come in here at any point and change your stuff. Okay. So, speaking about 3ds Max being used not only in visualization, but also in film and games, this gives you access to a whole bunch of special effects that we normally don't use that much in visualization but at any point we can and we can make it easy as well or very accessible because there are a lot of templates that we can just you know pick from like a buffet right so if you wanted to have a flock of birds we can use a parting system there's a template for with a flock of birds if you want to animate a fountain in you know an our foyer absolutely that's there's a template for that as well so here i would like to generate dust particles because I'm convinced that if you're doing visualization especially photoreal uh, visualization you're not selling you know an image you're selling emotion so you want to kind of add something special about your scene everyone can hit the render button and have kind of good goodish renderings these days uh, but adding some extra stuff that, that really kind of sometimes adds to the realism so dust particles where do I start well, the, the word gives it away, particles, that would, would make me want to start with particles. <laughs> um, so in that case, let me open up the particle system. So here we have, and this already looks like ooh, a little bit scary, but down here we have preset flows, M particle flows, um, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's kind of the preset flow. That's, that's the one that you want to refer to. As soon as we hit that, and I zoom in, we have some elements like air particles, uh, uh, earth particles, I don't know, pen and fire, do you need that? There's something like forest, so if you want to quickly scatter some trees in your scene, you can use particle systems for that as well. Fire, some basic logo animations, and water. I always talk about the five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and logo animations. Um, are they already exist? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are part of the uh, 3D Max installation. So I'm going to use the water snow template to create dust because I'm thinking, okay, snow might be less than something I can just take away the gravity and make them floating around in my in my scene. So why not? Um, yeah, if I just took that and take that in, uh, alter rename. There we go. So this is my snow particle template. That's all it does. Okay, and as you can see, there's gravity attached to that, and that's the whole, that's just it's too much stuff anyway. But it's a good starting point. Okay, if I delete that once again, uh, you can see the second step in that. So here I have the same particle system without the gravity. There's not much stuff going on right now. Right, it's just rotating in its, it's in, in its own space. So what we did, we added these little wind spheres so there's these the wind helpers i'm going to add these to the solution so it's more like wobbling around dust um, that's that's what i'm going to do right um ooh, if i can find it 
right there. So here I'm going to add it to my force. That's all already part of that preset, right? So as soon as I add that wind, now I have a little bit more variation, right? It's very subtle still, and it's way too big. You know, we can we can scale down the dust at any point in in, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, what's really annoying me, or <laughs> not really fitting in that whole look, you know, the dust is all over the place. What I wanted to achieve is having the, the sun going in here and only making the dust visible in the light rays. So the same as sometimes we can see it in the projector, so you have some dust particles in the, in the projector light beam, right? So that's kind of the idea. Um, so what can I do? I can, and I looked into the projector, I can see, I, uh, I have my layers, okay? And here I have um, just a basic box that has been scaled down on one side. And I'm going to use that box as an occlusion object. So I only want to have the particles displaying in that box. Okay, so uh, just to sh make it a little bit easier for you to see, I'm going to make it transparent. And then going back into my particle system, uh, <laughs> I can go down here. And there is a small little thing called a data operator. So for those of you who might have been using particle flow in the past, we added a few versions back, new particle operators. Uh, it's a particle flow two box two and three. So you now can solve volumetric particles, like stacking up stuff. And there is something called the data operator. And that's something where you can create your own particle systems basically program them, right? But this data operator works with presets, once again. So we can just load in a preset. And yes, uh, I want to use the light beam preset. I'm going to choose that, whoop, that object right here. And now I only have that dust particle stuff happening inside of that box. See that? Right, and the beauty is I can animate that box. I can animate the whole appearance when the sun travels by. I can again make it bigger or smaller, um, stuff like that. Hide it. So that's kind of my dust system right there. I can cache that out, use it in my rendering. Uh, it's really, really up to you. Uh, let me make it a little, little bit smaller, right? Cool. Perfect. So let me go quickly back into my PowerPoint. And I believe, uh, yes, there we go. Here we have a rendering where we see that lump of bread and cloth covering. So, so quite often we want to have curtains or a flag or maybe something like that or a pillow on the sofa or, um, you know, Whatever, you need at some point probably some cloth simulation. And that's something that you can easily do inside of 3ds Max. And there are some tips and tricks that I would like to share with you on how to quickly adjust the physical behavior of that cloth um, stuff. So let me hop into the next preset. And here we have lump of bread. Going to move that a little bit forward and maybe the cloth um, above, like there, nice. Okay, so the cloth already has an M cloth modifier on top of that, but it's the, like the basic M cloth modifier. Not, not much stuff has been done in here. In fact, nothing has been done in here. <laughs> what, I, what I want to do next is define the, the bread as a collision object. So I'm going to use the M cloth, uh, the, the mass effect system. So this is a, has its own toolbar, basically. I'm going to add these two objects, these two objects, into my simulation. And I'm also going to add the, the kitchen table into my simulation as a static object. There we go. <coughs> and then I only need to define the gravity. So for some reason I, I turned that off for a bit. And then I can start simulating. And I'm going to simulate by using the live dragging in my cloth. So that means I can now drag and drop, kind of, or pull that cloth over here. <coughs> it's not really behaving like a kitchen 
cotton towel. Uh, this is just like the physical behavior, the settings that we need to tweak. Again, the, the keyword is presets. There are, there's a preset for cloth in here. Exactly one preset um, that you can use. So I'm gonna, gonna, gonna choose from that. Let me uh, reset that and load my preset. The reason there's only one preset is basically we have two cloth systems in here. We have the M cloth system, it's a, it's a little bit faster and a little bit more restricted. And we have a cloth system. The cloth system has thick leather, uh, metal, chain, whatever, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of presets. Um, but for basic stuff like positioning cloth on a table, the M cloth is perfect. So I'm going to add the cotton, load it in, going back into my live drag, and you will see that now it behaves, you know, a whole lot different. Kind of. <laughs> Let me move that over there. That's alright. And I can also uh, capture that as my initial state. And I, because I added the bread as a kinematic object, I can go into play mode and I can do it the other way around. I can start moving my bread around, you know, and try to readjust the overall, um, you know, cloth behavior. And as soon as, as soon as I'm happy with that, I'm adding a shell modifier to give it some thickness and maybe a turbo smooth to smooth out the final shape and convert it back down to an edit poly because I didn't want to animate the simulation. I want to visualize the outcome, right? That's why I'm baking it down or converting it back down to an edit poly. Nice. Um, what else? So, yeah, let, let's, let's quickly talk about a modeling feature that is part of 3ds Max. I don't know um, how much of, of you have heard about Pixar's open subdivision technology. That's getting very technical, right? Uh, so think of it as a smoothing algorithm, like TurboSmooth or MeshSmooth, right? You start with a very basic shape like this. You just dial in and dial out the radius. So that's basically what it does. If I make it into Isoline display, you can actually see it a little, see it a little bit more clear, right? So, and the reason Pixar is using that is exactly uh, the reason. The reason basically is its art direction. So they want at any time to be able to come back in and change, you know, into uh, change the behavior or the the appearance of objects in Monster Academy and all that fancy movies out there. But it's now part of 3ds Max as well, so, so that, that's pretty cool. Uh, I can select the sync hole, so I can mix these crease sets up as well, right? So I have the sync hole and I want to make that round, and the rest of that should be more like a hard surface, right? And this is interchangeable. If you want to change, uh, send that over into Maya, for example, you can do that. It's taking over these kind of information and uh, you can use that for rendering. Yes. So let's say we wanted to animate. And quite often, if you just want to animate that, that room, it's too much information. So maybe you want to, you're an architect, you want to talk about the room and not about the dishes that are on that, on that table. But at some point you want to go into into that emotional aspect of things and start pop, you know, populating your scene with furniture, with flowers, maybe with characters, right? But it, it should appear somehow, somewhere in your animation. One aspect of doing that is using animation presets and that's actually something we added in extension 1 for 3ds Max 2016. Uh, basically how it works, you select a number of objects, so you have these dishes, these, and I'm going into my animations preset and loading in a preset. And that's just stuff I've, I've done. It's a basic preset that I'm going to use, a basic preset where I scaled up a teapot and from, from like scaling of zero, non-visible, up to 100% the initial size of the teapot. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm using that animation preset. All the stuff is gone, but now it's scaling up like this. And that's just the scaling plus a flex modifier. So the flex modifier gives that bouncy, bounciness. And what's really beautiful about that aspect of, of using animation presets is that it's adding it as a modifier. So you can offset 
that animation quite easily by just adding a per node delay of maybe not 10 but 3 frames and now it's all popping up almost at the same time. Or if you want to start at the left hand at these books, at these magazines, you can pick that object and uh, you know start from there. Normalize the order, there we go. Right. Hopefully everyone's using some sort of subscription these, these days because we just released a week ago extension 2 which gives you a whole lot of more stuff as well. Um, so it's really evolving, it's evolving fast. We really you know, hired a whole bunch of new developers for 3ds Max one and a half year ago and it's, it's really picking up momentum. I'm excited. Yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me show you one more thing what you want to use. You can copy paste um, maybe in a, win, a WinWord document over here. It will automatically recognize which fonts have been used in that WinWord document. You can open up a large text window, checks, etc. So all of that is possible since extension one basically, <laughs> right? Uh, <coughs> cool. Let me open up the last scene that I want to focus on and this is an exterior scene so while that's opening yeah so, so this is the one that's a combination of 3ds Max files or 3ds Max objects and Revit files so as I said you can natively import Revit data and it's important to understand that there's a difference between native import in 3ds Max 2016 and native import in 3ds Max 2015 because we had native import in 2015. But what happened is we launched, under the hood, we launched a non-user interface version of Revit, like a command line thing. And then it would open up that Revit file and it would probably see, oh, you're not using the latest version of Revit, so it would update that Revit file, same as Revit does, right? Then it would export it as an <coughs> FBX and import that FBX into Max. So that means a basic file from, from Revit to Max, re basic import, would take a long time. 20 minutes? I don't know. You don't even know what's happening because it's just doing something. So now in 2016 it's actually not converting it to FBX but natively loading in Revit data including BIM information so you can hold the attributes uh, of, of the whole BIM data in these, in these objects when you import Revit files. So that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, so here I have a Revit file linked into my scene. That's something you can do and if you wanted to add traffic for example you can use the civil connection I don't know, anyone used that in the past? One, two, maybe? No. So, it's complex. it is very complex. It's, it's a, like an add-on to 3ds Max. I always thought for a long time that this is something only civil, Autodesk civil users would want to use because that's the name, civil, okay. Um, but in fact, it's it can import civil data, but it also can work out of the box with your standard 3ds Max objects. So if you want to add traffic or uh, traffic lights only to your scene, you can use civil. And this is all now part, fully part of 3ds Max. Um, some users who have been using 3ds Max opposed to 3ds Max design didn't have access to that for all the years. So this is now part you know, of, of 3ds Max 2016. Mm. And it's basically based around splines. So if you have a spline like this, and you wanted to, to use it to add road markings to your road, all you have to do is go into your civil view, basically. And here we have a road markings and style editor. And again, we can work with presets based on that. So if you, if you know, yeah, basically based on your country um, standards, you would generate these presets one time. So here I'm generating, um, bah, 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 I'm generating this one. I have my shape, I believe. There we go. And I'm hitting apply. Let me see, a mark length. Nah. Let's do five centimeters. Okay, so here we have something. And then I can copy that. Maybe I want to have a second set of, um, you know, markings. 
and in that case I'm going to offset that a little bit to the side. So here I have, I can zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, I can offset it by 20 centimeters, doing a little bit of a gap length of two meters, I don't know, uh, and a mark length of, I'm not familiar with any road marking standards, so I'm just making this up, right? But that's, that's how it works. And it's still, thinking about proceduralism, it's still bound to that spline. So if you now change the spline and the overall you know, appearance of the road, the road markings will go along. And you can do more than that. You can actually select, um, I don't want to save that. Uh, you can actually select that spline once again go into civil view and here we have something called an object placement and style editor. <laughs> um, this allows you, zooming in again, this allows you to add stuff like furniture, trees, well, traffic signs or vehicles. So let me create a new object and now I'm going to choose from a bunch of cars. So here we are we have a library that is kind of pre-populated, but the good news is you can add your own cars, uh, your own characters to the system, right? You could have bananas flying around in your scene or teapots if you wanted to do that. And sometimes you don't want to have that photo real look or you don't want to have an American school bus, right? Uh, but that's more like a you know, local, local school bus, uh, then you can add these kind of libraries or objects into your scene as well. Uh, so I'm going to add multiple cars, maybe four, driving at 30 kilometers a second with an offset of 1 meter 50 to, I can never, I can never remember which side I have to offset them. Okay, th so now we are, we are in the UK, so they are all driving on the left hand side. <laughs> Um, but you know, they, they are, have turning wheels, um, they would actually behave correctly based on, yeah, based on your, your road markings really, right? And you can adjust that even more, don't want to save that. So here I'm going to show you this one. So here we added a populate character, ah, I want to move. Uh, here I added a populate character on top of a bike or bicycle and we added that to that civil library so we can just attach that to that civil spline as well. Very good. Perfect. So that's kind of uh, the, the tips I have. Of course, you can use any renderer that you want to implement into 3ds Max. So they are shipping with Mentiray and iRay, yeah. uh, and no V-Ray natively, right? So V-Ray is, is the most commonly used commercial renderer for visualization inside of 3ds Max. That's fact, and there are tons of V-Ray tutorials and V-Ray assets, library assets, um, asset libraries uh, that you can download and put into your scene. So, so V-Ray is a very good starting point to, to really raise the bar for your, um, you know, for your rendering. We also offer cloud rendering now in 3ds Max. Currently not for V-Ray, right? So this is all based on Mentoray or Autodesk materials. But in order to access this, you go uh, access cloud rendering, you go into your rendering and bam. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, oh, so here you can see I have Corona installed, V-Ray installed. That's not part of the offering. It's just, you know, I'm stuff that I'm using on top. And that's the A360 cloud rendering. The beauty of that is, well, sending it off to the cloud doesn't block your machine at all. And it's able to produce these Google Cardboard panorama renderings. So you can put it into your, uh, onto your phone, uh, into one of these $5 cardboard things and then you can give it out to your customer and he can have kind of an immers uh, immersive experience based on what you are doing. Um, let me see, so here I have, whew, my machine is slowing down. Here I have some render outputs, if I can open that, yeah, so that's just as you can see, the, the quality is not like super high end, but that's basically the standard output out of the um, out of the cloud rendering. And it doesn't currently doesn't support animations, for example. So there are some some restrictions certainly, but 
for, for some quick stuff where you just import into 3 Max and you want to render it as fast as possible, that's, that's a quite good or valid solution. I'm sorry? If you, if you get 30 points per user for free, you mean? or I'm not familiar. I thought it was more that you get, like on a yearly subscription, you get more like 100 yeah, free cloud yeah, credits? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, but the good news again is, you know, Autodesk is talking to a lot of different render companies at the moment, you know, to Arnold, to Pixar, uh, Renderman guys basically, to V-Ray. Uh, we've integrated the Chaos Group camera into 3ds Max, now in 3ds Max 2016. So when you are creating a camera like this, you now have access to all these physical, um, well, render settings giving you access to aperture, for example. So if you wanted to do an interior shot and then go outside with your DSLR camera, I mean the phone, if the phone is doing that automatically for you, but with the, with the DSLR, DSLR camera, you would have to readjust the, the aperture and all of that. And you can do that exactly in the same manner with that physical camera. So you can quickly, um, you know, mix between an interior shot and an exterior shot. You also have perspective control, like lens shift stuff, stuff like that costs a lot of money to do in the real world. You have available right at your fingertips with that physical camera. Um, so, but my, my point was that we are not only trying to focus on, on Menta Ray and, and nobody's using Menta Ray, but we are in fact reaching out to all the different render, rendering vendors and trying to make yeah, them collaborate more easily with the material systems inside of 3ds Max and open up doors for them that you know might in the long run make all your lives easier like V-Ray faster or Corona faster stuff, stuff like that cool um, yeah and that's the creative market app that's basically something that has a connection to 3ds Max it's like TurboSquid or Evermotion I mean they have Evermotion has all their libraries on creative market as well this is a creative market platform that is being run by Autodesk and you can create your own marketplace so you can you know put your own content on there uh, we have a team that is overlooking or kind of regulating the overall quality of these assets that are being placed on there so it's it's not like everything you can't put a table on there that's just made out of out of a box without any details right so stuff like that so we're trying to create on on that a360 rendering, yeah, and this is my email address. Um, I think we are just in time, right? Time, 10 minutes early, is that? Five minutes early, I believe? Five minutes, so, so quite good. Any questions? So, yes. In terms of a rendering process, not a rendering process, let's say a pre-rendering process, what do you think are the most important elements to look at in terms of what you, in terms of lighting, material, what what do you think are elements that make your render a bit better than your than just an image that is static that is just material, etc. Right. Okay. So, like, do you have a process that you usually work with? Yes. As a certain Absolutely. So, so how to, to create, you know, in terms of pre-renderings, how to define the perspective, how to set up the lighting, all of that, how to get a better quality overall. They are helpers, like not only big books about photography that you can read, etc. But there are scripts that uh, you can just track and drop into your scene. I'm checking if I can find one. Um, so one is called Image Comp Helper, and this is going to give you the golden ratio and um, you know all these different kind of uh, rule of thirds, all, all that stuff right into your, in your viewport. So you can lay out the perspective based on these, yeah, quite quite rudimental photography uh, rules, right? So it's called Image Comp Helper. It's available for, for free on ScriptSpot, and. <laughs> It seems that it's somewhere buried. I w wasn't planning on showing it, so it's somewhere buried in my in my scene. Which side is it available? Uh, Scriptspot.com. Yeah, unfortunately, again, I don't have Wi-Fi here, but I can. I can. Let me do it like this. So, sc Scriptspot.com in terms of lighting, and it will look better than placing lights all over the place. I know it's. 
uh, kind of appealing to put a lot of photome photometric lights in your scene because you can, but you shouldn't always, right? So if you don't look for specific IS lights on your walls, yeah, just don't put them in, right? Uh, that's kind of the, the tip. Like you said, anyone can render a good render, but I mean, to get those certain touches yeah. that yeah, it's it's a lot about composition, right? It's the perspective, it's colors. Uh, also, like like uh, kind of trying to to tell a story with your perspective, not always showing the whole room. Um, you know, try to to cut away some of the information and display it on a different. Yeah. Also, also it's just some doing doing putting in trees that maybe you have just some leaves le leaning into your camera to put in some sense of scale and and, and frame you, frame the view absolutely yeah these are uh, and again it all leads back to photographic rules uh, I have like a whole bunch of slides only on that um, I might be able to put it up online so if you share your card with me yeah if you, if you, if you drop an email I can put it definitely online yeah. So, yes. yes. Two questions. The first one is what kind of elements you leave for post production? Mm -hmm. you don't know them. And the second question is the Revit file that is natively imported in 3 Max 2016, is it a live model? What kind of, what, what's the difference between natively importing it and file link manager in the previous versions? Okay, so, so the first question was what kind of elements do I output in order to do a post-production um, and this really differs on the workflow but but the the answer I get because I'm asking that to my visualization studios that I'm visiting right so, so and they say everything so as much as they can um, also output open XR so you have the full um, depth for uh, post-processing for for Exposure settings, etc. Right, but, but I, I believe the most important ones are definitely something like reflection and have your globe illumination separate uh, and indirect illumination separate, uh, like direct and indirect. Uh, but definitely, if you're going for V-Ray, select as much as you can, open uh, and output it in an Open XR file and put it into into Photoshop. And the difference between Life Link, it's File Link Manager. I think yes. It was called in 2014. Yes. So now the it was the live model. So basically, if you yeah. change the Revit, it will change the 3ds Max. Well. Yes. So so the live link in previous to 3ds Max 2016 between Revit and Max was still using under the hood the FBX conversion. So that was was what made it slower. And now with the live link uh, or file link um, in 2016, you don't have that conversion. So it's just faster. Yeah. That's yeah. Walls and the doors. Is it something like uh, the adaptability of the of the change in the position of the door? You showed an example. Yeah. Right. Is it that kind of AEC walls or something like that which we used to have? Exactly. Before? That's what I did. So so we did the, that MCG door and then moved the door and the the hole would readjust. I was combining the AEC wall with the MCG object. So I, I basically linked the MCG door to an AEC kind of object and when I move the MCG wall it will readjust that and that's kind of the for me that's the beauty about MCG because it's it's really it's not like an addition or like like a third-party thing it's it's working within Max with all these tools that are already there right all right if you have any more questions feel free to come up I, I'll be around for a while as well thank you so much for your time today and I uh, hope you enjoy the the rest of the day cheers thank you Thank you.